Hello and welcome to the Real News Network. My name is David Kattenberg reporting. Today it's my pleasure to have a, a, a couple of guests um, with us from the Netherlands. And Ronnie, you are, are you right now in Israel? Yes, I'm in Palestine at the moment. Palestine, right. We're going to get to that, that distinction. A couple of interesting uh, items in the news today. Interesting news often comes in, in pairs. Uh, uh, on the 13th of October, a, a joint letter uh, was published um, by b both The Guardian and, uh, and an open letter in NBC News uh, co-signed by or regarding a, a letter that has been sent to Google and Amazon uh, signed by uh, roughly 900 Amazon and Google workers calling on the, the two tech giants to cancel their involvement in something called Project Nimbus, which is a $1.2 billion venture that will provide cloud services to the Israeli government and military and to the Israeli Land Authority, the agency that essentially steers Israel's continued expansion of settlements in the, in the occupied West Bank in violation of international law. So um, nearly 1,000 anonymous signatories at Amazon and more than 600 at Google have joined this call, which is kind of astonishing. Um, at the same time, this week there is a conference taking place in the city of Malmö in Sweden, uh, the International Forum on Holocaust Remembrance and Combating Antisemitism, attended by Israeli lobbyists and EU officials um, and one of the, the major items in the agenda is discussion of the, uh, the controversial International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism, which critics say uh, uh, muzzles free political expression uh, and, and, and expression of free points of view about the, the, the so-called conflict in Israel and Palestine. So two interesting items of news uh, with me to to discuss these uh, are uh, Ronnie Barkan, who is a Jewish Israeli activist and dissident, one of the founding members of a group called Boycott from Within, and one of uh, three individuals who were charged by a Berlin court back in 2020 for disrupting a talk by an Israeli official at Humboldt University in, in Berlin, and they were charged with trespass and um, uh, various other things, and they were acquitted acquitted in August of 2020. So that's Ronnie Barkan with me as well as Anda Young, who's a member of the Faculty of Social, Social and Behavioral Sciences at the University of Amsterdam and the author of a, a paper entitled Zionist Hegemony and the Settler Colonial Conquest of Palestine and uh, the problem with conflict, a critical genealogy of the notion of binary conflict. Interesting. Uh, and Young was also um, one of those who participated in the Gaza flotilla in 2010, and she and, and others were uh, stopped in their in their tracks on the high seas and uh, treated rather poorly by the Israeli military. So Anda Young and and Ronnie Barkan, it is a pleasure to have you both w with me here on the Real News. Can I just ask you each in turn to tell me what? What your thoughts are on uh, on this the Malmo conference in Sweden, where they're discussing the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism, and the fears are that uh, free speech is going to be muzzled. Uh, are you concerned that uh, a gathering of this sort uh, essentially hinders or stands to compromise your ability to speak freely? about the situation in what, what I'll call Palestine-Israel or Israel-Palestine. Ronnie, why don't you begin? Okay, so um, thank you for having me. Um, I think that, first of all, I'm not at all concerned about different uh, organizations, uh, governments, etc., uh, trying to um, muzzle freedom of expression. I mean, I'm not personally concerned. I'm concerned about the situation in large. But uh, personally, I think that this is an opportunity for us to tackle these issues because, for example, when in the IHRA definition or the misdefinition, which which turns on its head 
the whole idea of anti-Semitism. They have basically gone against, by the way, in a way that that goes against even the the person who initiated, who was initially writing the IHRA, the IHRA definition. This was applied in a way that that person didn't even intend for it to be applied. And the way that they are trying to apply that very problematic definition is in order to conflate a criticism of the criminal apartheid state, the criminal Zionist race state, with Judaism. Now, uh, or with anti-Jewish sentiment. And actually, it couldn't be farther from the truth. I would argue very clearly that there is absolutely no connection whatsoever between Zionism and Judaism, and I can talk much about that, and any conflation whatsoever between the two is in itself anti-Semitic in its very nature. It, uh, it implies that those who are Zionist or those who are Jewish, uh, let's say in a broad sense, by religion or otherwise, are also necessarily Zionist. And that in itself, to say myself, because I'm somehow regarded as Jewish, I'm also a, a supportive of that criminal a, a supremacist enterprise that in itself a kind of, you know, amalgamates all Jews into one a monolithic group. And it says that we are all uh, criminals and, and barbarians, etc. So that in itself is a very racist uh, approach. Now, every Israeli... Um, representative says that if you're critical of the um, of the state of Israel, you're also somehow anti-Semitic. And, and we have to be very straight with the logic. What, what I just said is that if they say that if you're critical of the state of Israel, then you must also be somehow against Jews. It also means exactly what I mentioned before, that if you are Jewish because of this or that criteria, you must also be necessarily supporting of that criminal apartheid state. So we have to challenge the entire idea of conflating between the two. And Jung, what are your thoughts on, on this conference now taking place in Sweden where the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism is being promulgated and adopted? Is this a threat to free speech in, in places um, like the Netherlands and Germany and elsewhere? Uh, yes and no. Yes, it's a threat to free speech um, uh, in the sense that it stifles debate it intimidates particularly uh, young people, uh, young scholars, for example, who are working in the academy and want to speak out about the situation. On the other end, no, I would say not, because the, the war of discourse has been going on for a very long time. And if you are involved, like Ronnie, for example, or like me, for a long time, you also realize that this is actually an opportunity to challenge discourse. Um, the very long paper you mentioned before, and don't worry for people who do not want to read the academic stuff, there's plenty of other stuff uh, uh, more accessible, but really focuses on uh, the war of narratives and discourse uh, surrounding Israel, Palestine, Palestine, Israel. Um, and mostly what I want to add to the very important distinction that Ronnie uh, laid forward, the distinction between Jewish Jews and on the other hand, Zionism as a political ethno-nationalist uh, project. Um, and the other point that I, I think is important to um, to point out that the uh, while it looks like a stiffening of free speech, it actually challenges the peace and conflict paradigm. The peace and conflict paradigm meaning that there is uh, a conflict between two sides and the desired solution is peace. And while that sounds very innocent, it actually really distorts what's going on on the ground because it distorts that it uh, actually concerns a very unequal power relation. It's one between a highly militarized state with lots of international support and an oppressed uh, uh, indigenous people, the Palestinians. It also legitimizes um, human rights violations, right? Because in a conflict, obviously, there's violence and one needs to defend itself rather than actually what's going on is very much uh, an occupation, a military occupation. And for third, a reason why I really object to the peace and conflict paradigm and why I think it's good that, that now at least we're talking about how and the words we should use is because it does not reflect reality on the ground. This is not two states, two people next to each other fighting. It's a military occupation of the West Bank. It's a near to full uh, blockade of Gaza, which basically means an open air prison. It's segregation in Jerusalem, and it is institutional discrimination within Israel. And in all the land between the seas, as uh, is often referred to, it's apartheid. Um, very simply saying um, that there is a distinction between people based on their ethno-nationalist identity. 
But and I mean to I say this while, sort of thing. While I think it, the definition is definitely challenging because it would incriminate me as an academic for doing my job and for critically looking at human rights violations. I also think it's important that we at least have the opportunity to counter this and say, hold on, what you're saying is not actually academic or theoretical or reflects reality on the ground. So I um, surely do uh, am worried about definitions like these. On the other hand, I rather see them as an opportunity to discuss the very basics of what's going on in Palestine. But I mean, to say what you are saying, to use the word apartheid, to describe Israel, the state of Israel as an apartheid state or a settler colonial state, or to suggest that the Palestinian people are, are the ones who are indigenous to the land, th these very assertions are categorized under the IHRA definition of, of anti-Semitism as anti-Semitic. Uh, yes, but it has nothing to do with um, what, what my entire work is against human rights violation and against all forms of racism and exclusion. And what I'm uh, doing with my work is looking at the basic problem in Palestine, Israel. And that is on the one hand, those who adhere that um, human rights should only count for Jewish Israeli inhabitants of Palestine. And on the other hand, there's people who say, well, human rights should be regardless of one ethno-nationalist identity. And if that definition is anti-Semitic, I would say that the definition itself is anti-Semitic because it claims Judaism for a political entity called Zionist. And it, that is an unfair equation. And it is not an academic equation. It's a very political equation. We should also... Um ask actually what brings about this uh, challenging uh, or, or this def defining and redefining of anti-Semitism and, and that is the, the issue that it is all about trying to silence any and all criticism of that Zionist race state which some people claim to be Jewish. Um, and, and even when we talk about the IHRA definition, which is a terrible definition, it doesn't hold water. It is a cyclical, uh, from the legal perspective, it is, it, is it is defined in a cyclic way, et cetera. But that definition in itself uh, is, is not as problematic as the use that they are trying to apply to it. And uh, following that definition, there is a whole list of examples of how they implement that problematic definition and the implementation is even far worse than the way they define it. So even if we uh, challenge the definition in itself, this is not the only issue that we have to bear in mind because the whole idea is how they intend to implement it in a very, very convoluted way. And I fully agree with everything that uh, Anne said about uh, how it is being used. Ronnie Barkan and, and Anne de Jong, the European Union and, and its member states, uh, uh, particularly uh, the United Kingdom and France and, and, and Germany included, but the EU at the highest level, declares Israel's uh, settlement enterprise to be flagrantly unlawful and is uh, uh, highly critical of I Israeli activities in the occupied territories. And yet at the same time, the European Union and its member states, most notably, again, uh, Germany, the UK, France, extend, and the European Union extend what seems to be unconditional support to the state of Israel to do what it wants, uh, and actually uh, extend economic aid and assistance uh, and cooperate with the Israeli establishment, notwithstanding their, their absolutely categorical position that, that Israel's, Israel's uh, um, activities and enterprise are, are illegal under international law. How do you explain this? How do you explain that on the one hand, the European Union is totally categorical about the unlawfulness of Israelis, Israel's activities. On the other hand, it extends its support and, and actually seeks to, some would say, criminalize criticism of Israel. How do you explain this kind of uh, contradiction? And? Well, I would say that in uh, in the Netherlands, at least, it is based on, uh, uh, on on partly historical guilt. I mean, what happened during the Holocaust is horrific, and um, the Dutch state completely uh, worked with uh, uh, Nazi Germany on that. So it's a historic guilt misplaced on the situation in Israel and Palestine. 
It also has a lot to do with economic interest. Um, but above all, I would say it's the residue of the peace and conflict paradigm. Uh, people, uh, political parties um, and uh, uh, companies are afraid to burn their hands by even engaging in uh, and about talking about this. So they really say, oh, it's a conflict, it's too complicated. Um, you have to be balanced between the two sides. And by abhorring to that view, you basically say nothing at all because it's too complex and too difficult. Um, but while I, I when looking at the Netherlands, I actually find the interesting part not the policy. I have no um, hope or ambition that uh, the Dutch government somehow uh, will be a front runner in the struggle uh, for social justice. But I do think it's very interesting to see that within uh, Dutch grassroots society, there is a big change going on and people are discussing what's going on. There is active, uh, active demonstrations and BDS, call for BDS. And on the television, Palestinian films are shown um, during the latest uh, May uh, 21 uh, attack on Gaza, for example, they published huge op ads and places um, discussing should we call Israel an apartheid state. Um, I think then uh, that um, the politicians uh, or policy will not so much push for change, uh, but like uh, instances in South Africa, the people will finally push the politics to adopt a different stance. Ronnie Barkan? Yes. Um, we have to understand that uh, when the EU, for example, um, tries to speak this discourse about uh, being somewhat critical of certain settlement activity in the occupied West Bank, uh, when they criticize to a certain degree certain practices, even with inside what is regarded as Israel proper, that when they promote the patently false discourse about a conflict a resolution or a two-state solution, they are actually trying to um, cover up uh, their involvement in promoting a deeply supremacist race state, which practices crimes against humanity for the past seven decades. And I would refer especially in that context to the EU-Israel Association Agreement, which is basically the trade agreement and more than that, uh, dealing with the business ties between uh, the entire EU and Israel. And in that agreement, Article 2 of that agreement says very clearly that if there is a consistent human rights violation, uh, in Israel, and obviously there is, then the whole uh, agreement is null and void. Basically, the EU can take corrective measures, they can sanction, uh, they can freeze the agreement, they can they can do all kinds of actions. What they cannot do uh, under their own, according to their own written document, what they cannot do is carry on doing business as usual with Israel. What they choose to do is that every EU member state looks the other way, chooses to look the other way in order to protect and promote Israeli crimes against humanity. This is how we should be treating uh, that issue, how the involvement of the, of the EU in actually shielding Israel from criticism, and yes, obviously, and shielding Israel from criticism also uh, implies that they do uh, criticize to a certain degree, just a little bit, in order to give a semblance of plur pluralism and criticism, etc. You know that whenever we are being told, especially as BDS activists, we're being told that uh, it is perfectly fine to criticize the policies of the state of Israel, but, but the moment that we start criticizing the very nature, the very character of that race state, then we are being tagged as anti-Semitic, etc. And what I argue is that it is the exact opposite. We should only focus on that criminal an illegitimate, uh, to the core, character of that state, which is all about uh, white supremacy, uh, you know, ethnic uh, supremacy, ethnic racial supremacy, and ethnic domination. Ronnie, it's rather risky to, to say the sorts of things that you say in Germany. Um, we hear that Germany has actually criminalized this sort of discourse, that to talk about uh, promote boycott, divestment, and sanctions, or to call Israel an apartheid state, settler, colonial, racist state, to, to refer to Zionism as racism. One can be uh, criminally charged in Germany for saying these kinds of things. Is, is that is that true, or is that really a misconception? It, it is. It has almost been criminalized. Uh, so basically, for example, uh, quite recently, the Bundestag, the German parliament, uh, passed a resolution uh, 
saying that criticism, uh, that basically BDS uh, is somehow uh, anti-Semitic. Now that um, that resolution is being referred to all the time, uh, and this was passed by the coalition, by the spd uh, coalition. But uh, again, I would stress that whatever I said about the EU, it is far worse with regard to German complicity in Israeli crimes against humanity, because it was actually, there was an incident where the entirety of the German Bundestag they uh, voted about three different resolutions. One resolution which passed and two other resolutions, one of the so-called left, Die Linke, and the other of AfD, the right wing. And all three motions said the exact same thing in the different wording, but uh, implying the exact same thing. And every single member of that parliament either voted in favor or, or abstained. There was not a single voice of dissent questioning that false equation between BDS and anti-Semitism. So it goes far deeper than only saying that this is somewhat criminalized, etc. It says that there is a wall-to-wall -wall support for this patently false discourse, and, and not only false discourse, this says that our struggle for equality, our struggle against a rac racial supremacy, against apartheid, which is defined in the law as a crime against humanity, on par with genocide, our struggle against that is, at the very least, a, a, you know, we should be ashamed and we will be sanctioned for it, if not actually, uh, you know, regarded as criminals. And this comes from a state which has committed genocide and has, seems to have learned nothing from its past. And this is, it's reputationally hazardous to say the sorts of things that you're saying. I mean, you're Jewish Israeli, you are... Uh, white, if I may use that term, yes. uh, but if one is a Palestinian, um, a, a person of Palestinian descent and, and, and speaks out about these things, they can lose their job at the university. They can be sanctioned. Yes, especially in Germany, the, the, uh, there is uh, quite a lot of strength to that, um, those accusations, false accusations uh, of anti-Semitism against uh, different people. People can definitely uh, be sanctioned, as I mentioned, for example, uh, lose their job simply for speaking up for Palestinian rights or against Israeli crimes. Uh, and this is the case in Germany, and we have to deal with that. On a, this is a social uh, issue, not only a legal or political issue. And I would argue, especially in Germany, and the reason that I, I, I was living in Germany for a few years was exactly in order, in order to challenge all of that, uh, because I see Germany as basically the last standing bastion for Zionism. When all countries of the world will, will realize that something is desperately wrong with Zionism, still Germany will you know, hold on strong in its support to, for Zionism. And that is why I see that my role there is actually, uh, you know, I, I can be possibly more effective in challenging that in Germany, exactly because of what we were discussing here. Uh, and so, so we have to, to understand that it is very difficult to criticize uh, Israel in Germany, and there is a wall-to-wall -wall support both uh, within the political arena and also among uh, the society. So, and, and, and this is a very uh, tough struggle that, yes, that needs to be, uh, to be handled, yes. And what's the situation in the Netherlands? Is it, is it uh, reputationally hazardous to, to speak out yeah, about these things? In the Netherlands, um, it's it's a little bit more uh, a, a silent monster. Uh, it's in the sense that we do not have the official um, H, uh, IHR, IA definition yet. We do not have a policy where you can be punished for speaking out. Freedom of speech is very, very crucial in Dutch society and also in Dutch universities. That said, the consequences for individuals who speak out is really, really severe. Um, for me right now, it's easier to speak than, let's say, 10 years ago, because I am an associate professor and I do have tenure. I have a university that has my back. That said, every time you do speak out about human rights, you're called an activist. And this is not in any way, shape or form an accident. They do that very much on purpose to challenge your credentials and to challenge what you say. Why? Because they do feel that if a, a university professor or someone outside of the realm of but these are pro-Palestinian activists, start saying these things, um, it becomes difficult to uphold their very uh, political and, 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 and um, uh, ethno-nationalist uh, agenda. So in the Netherlands, what happens if you speak out, um, it, uh, you get uh, reprimanded 
very much on social media. Media, you get threats. You get threats from uh, from in your home address. Um, these threats are mostly uh, very gendered, so to to um, particularly attacking uh, women and young women, and very racialized. Very much anyone who uh, has a non-Dutch background uh, gets targeted. What they do is defunding. So people who are like, oh, but you're an activist academic, therefore you are to be taken uh, less um, less serious. There's uh, lawsuits, constant stream of lawsuits. Luckily, the University of Amsterdam has been good so far. Uh, after you have to uh, make your case why you're not an activist and an academic, which I uh, find problematic to begin with, but that's a, that's a, maybe something we can continue uh, to later. Um, there is very much a fear of reputation and um, indirect stifling of voices. Because if you are an early uh, a master's student or a PhD student or not yet tenured at university, you will not even dare to touch this subject because it will damage your career. It's not the case. If it will damage your career, it will damage uh, your career. Um, for me personally, I cannot uh, uh, not speak out. It would actually go against my academic integrity. Uh, because if you are focusing on human rights in the Middle East, you cannot in any way, shape or form not see the huge human rights violations by Israel. Um, so it's a matter of academic freedom is there, but it is stifled uh, because it is huge consequences uh, for individuals, especially uh, women and people of color. Uh, I would like to give you an example, if I may. Yes, please, quickly. Of the way that we are being treated in Germany. Uh, and I'm talking, we, uh, the, those who are among the privileged, white, even uh, those who come from a Jewish descent, um, three Jewish activists, including myself, uh, went to challenge the Israel Tag, the, the celebrations of Israel Day, um, what so called Israeli independence, which is also Nakba Day. Uh, and this was uh, done in Berlin. Uh, in the open and also uh, the, with the presence of the Israeli ambassador there. Uh, and we went there, three activists um, uh, holding signs. So, so the moment that the first person uh, opened her banner uh, challenging Israeli apartheid, she was uh, taken by force by the police. Uh, when I was about to pull my sign out, I was actually jumped by uh, German police, gagged twice. I was gagged while being dragged to the ground, etc., uh, and also later on dragged, uh, gagged again by German police while being in handcuffs. This was all filmed uh, on my camera on Facebook Live, so some people got a chance to get a glimpse of that, but a few minutes later, this was totally removed off Facebook. Uh, and all three of us were detained. I spent, uh, I was uh, kind of arrested for a little while, but, uh, and, and, uh, so, so this was totally, um, we, we, we were totally sa uh, silenced physically uh, and obviously politically. Uh, and also every evidence, uh, or most of the evidence was basically removed from uh, social media. We managed to find some video actually by uh, another participant, a Zionist participant who filmed part of that incident and the viewers can go and watch that. I can send a link later. A uh, final question, if I can ask each of you to be as, as brief as you can. D do you see winds of change within the European Union and within uh, key states within the European Union vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, policy towards Israel and, and the, the so-called conflict there and uh, Israel's, Israel's behavior and violation of international law? Do you see governments shifting in their, in their stance towards Israel and the EU? to put teeth, uh, give teeth to, to, to their statements? Well, regarding the uh, European Union or the Dutch government, I have no illusion whatsoever about spontaneous political change. Uh, just zero. I don't think it's a left or right thing. I do believe that it's a, it's a topic that they don't want to uh, risk their uh, political stance for. Uh, so there I'm not very optimistic. However, I am really optimistic, at least in the Netherlands and also worldwide. If you look at uh, young Jewish people, uh, young uh, activists of conscience who want to uh, in be um, uh, included in human rights struggle. In that sense, I do think that finally and very rightfully so, um, uh, Israel is becoming uh, South Africa of our times. 
and you can see that people start to look at it in terms of human rights and human rights struggle. Um, if you look at major uh, social change, for example, uh, uh, abolition of slavery or the um, end of segregation or the end of apartheid in South Africa, it was people power first. And I do think uh, if we look at the current European Union, there's the new generation, our generation, the new generation, uh, is um, very brave and it speaks up and it keeps speaking up and it's uh, very eloquent in how they do so. They do so via law, they do so via BDS, they do so via direct protests. It is happening in cultural institutions and also uh, in universities. So uh, policy, political wise, not so much. Uh, on the grassroots, the winds are changing and um, human rights are being put on the forefront again. Ronnie? Yes. If, if politicians would have done, would have been doing their job, then it wouldn't be left for us. Then then Israeli apartheid would not be able to carry on uh, doing whatever it does because it gets full support both from the US and the EU and many other countries. Um, but what EU countries are choosing to do, uh, to do is actually uh, act against their own laws, European laws, obviously acting against uh, international law in that respect by protecting Israel. So now it is up to us, the people, to speak up and to act. And I'm very happy to see the change happening. There is, There are winds of change happening. And this only increases at the moment the activity against us by these institutions mentioned before. Now, um, for example, that uh, letter by uh, Google and um, Amazon and please, that is uh, very refreshing. And I'm very happy to see that. I've been trying to, um, to bring to light the, the whole um, involvement of Israeli IT companies uh, in occupation and apartheid. Myself, I'm an IT professional, and I used to condition my work in this or that company by only working with civilians, because it is not very common to only work with civilians. Uh, most, if, if not all, Israeli IT companies are actually heavily involved with, at the very least, Israeli ministries, if not uh, the military and the Shin Bet. Uh, I even, uh, uh, for example, resigned from a startup company that I used to work uh, in in the past, the moment that they were purchased by Oracle, Oracle, a uh, very large IT company, uh, which uh, its business in Israel, actually one third of its business is uh, uh, with the Israeli army. Uh, it holds one conference a year specifically only for military personnel. So so I, obviously I couldn't, I, I couldn't uh, participate in that. So I'm very happy to see that these things are changing. There are these voices coming from uh, IT professionals around the world, from other communities around the world. We are joining forces uh, with Black Lives Matter, indigenous groups around the world. This is very, very important because we have to understand that by doing that, we are also finally able to change the discourse. And this is why uh, these institutions are so afraid because it is not only about this or that occupation. Um, it is about a whole system of oppression, which is also uh, a criminal system uh, acting against, uh, I mean, uh, committing crimes against humanity for the past seven decades and more. And this system of oppression, like apartheid uh, in South Africa, like slavery in the US, etc., the only way to abolish that system is to abolish it. It doesn't mean abolishing the state, it means abolishing that system of oppression. And there is no way around it. We cannot seek half equality or three quarters equality. It is either equality or nothing. And the moment that we demand the rights of Palestinians, and I will make it even simpler. The moment that we demand equality and return, it works very well in Hebrew, shivyon uh, v'shiva. The moment that we demand equality and return, we are demanding the most radical thing that we could ever, ever imagine in this place, because this land, uh, this Zionist race state, is all about denying exactly that. It is all about creating an uh, a state for one and only one people at the expense of all the others, especially if they are the indigenous people to this land. And when we discuss the issue of apartheid, for example, it is not only that this or that apartheid in the West Bank and Gaza, which is horrible, which is unbearable. The most part of Israeli apartheid is that which exists since the very foundation of the state of Israel, which means that six million people today are, the, are living in forced exile and they have been living in forced exile for the past seven decades simply for having the wrong ethnicity. They're in forced exile for the crime of wrong ethnicity. This is the heart of the matter, that people are denied even from living on their land, from returning home, 
only because of their racial ethnic characteristics. And also when we talk about Gaza, yes, the situation is unbearable. 95% of the water is 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 not potable. Uh, and the entire destruction and, and the bombing of Gaza. And yet, when there was the march of return of those people from Gaza, 70% of whom are refugees, when there was the march of return, uh, certain organizations, including pro-Palestinian organizations, claim that this is a march against uh, the criminal siege of Gaza. It is not. It is about their right to return home, home here in Palestine. I'm going to jump in there, Ronnie. Thank you so much. One could go on uh, at great length about this. Uh, I'd like to thank both of you for joining me today on The Real News. Uh, Ronnie Barkan is a Jewish-Israeli activist and dissident, one of the founding members of a group called Boycott From Within, and Annie de Jong, Anne de Jong, is a faculty member in the, uh, the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences at the University of, of Amsterdam. Um, uh, before we go, please don't forget to subscribe to The Real News YouTube channel and head on over to therealnews.com slash support to become a sustainer of the network. Every dollar ensures that we can keep bringing you important coverage of this sort, conversations such as the one you've just listened to. Thank you so much for watching and listening. This is David Kattenberg reporting for the Real News Network.